welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 41 of the Madden America podcast. This week, Emily Shearer Cutler interviews activist Sarah David Al. Joining us this week is Sarah David Al, a psychiatric survivor and prolific activist for the human rights of people labeled mentally ill. Sarah serves as the director of the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community and is a founding member of the Hearing Voices USA Board of Directors. Through her work, she has gained a range of experiences, including starting up a peer respite, opening resource centers, and producing educational materials on non-coercive, non-pathologizing alternatives to the traditional mental health system. Sarah is a regular blogger for Madden America and has written extensively on the topics of forced treatment and sexual violence. Today, we'll be discussing the parallels and intersections between coercive psychiatric care and sexual assault. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Emily. Could you start by telling us a little bit about your personal experience with both coercive psychiatry and sexual violence? Sure. So I don't want to take up too much time with this part, but my story includes sexual, physical, and emotional abuse starting as a child. And some of it is a clearer memory than others. It's something I really struggled with starting, I think, around the age of four. I have a sort of vague memory of a neighborhood boy that my family thought it was safe to leave me with and ended up not being safe. And that continued through my teenage years and into my adulthood in these interactions with men in my life, often people who were older than me who expected things out of me that I couldn't quite say no to or that even if I said no to, they really weren't interested in listening to me. And I think that that really set me up to enter a psychiatric system that also wanted to tell me what it wanted and needed from me and to put me in a position of not really feeling like I had a right to say no. Fortunately for me, there's always been this rebellious, quote unquote, non-compliant person underneath all of that, that didn't take too long to start pushing back, but I have experienced forced hospitalization. I haven't experienced some of the worst of the restraints and things that I've heard in other people's stories, but I've certainly experienced a lot of coercion and force and witnessing of other people's stories as well. And, and honestly, when I think about sexual violence and some of the psychiatric abuse that I've experienced, they have felt quite similar at times, even the language, the way that I've been spoken about has felt quite similar at times in those two experiences. And what are some of the parallels between forced psychiatric treatment and sexual violence? Well, I think the most obvious way that the two overlap is in actual violations of of one's body. So I've experienced or heard stories, witnessed people being restrained and then forced drugged. I've even heard of people more recently being forced intubated. And I, you know, I just, I think of having something going into your body, that sort of penetration into your body and this strange division that society makes between penetration as it applies to rape versus penetration as it applies to forced drugging or intubation. And I'm not sure why people think that those are two different worlds other than they've convinced themselves that one is harmful and one is for someone's own good. But I don't think that their experience is all that different in the moment by people. And in fact, I think I've heard many people say that they feel quite similar. I think that there's other examples as well, though. I think that strip searching people is still Mm -hmm. a pretty common practice. I think it was just at a... self-injury training yesterday and somebody was talking about how one hospital's practice if they know that you are someone who cuts or burns or what have you in terms of self-injury that they require that person to strip 
and then they document every mark on that person's body and that's just so violating mm-hmm. that level of vulnerability and, and having someone looking at and evaluating your body and, and using it without your permission and I yeah, I don't know why people think that that's okay absolutely yeah me neither I did want to ask about forced containment or involuntary commitment as well. Are there any parallels between that specifically and sexual violence? Sure. So I think that it's important, and I appreciate that you're making the distinction between forced, quote-unquote, treatment and forced containment. I'm not even sure that forced treatment is an apt description of things like forced drugging. I don't, I don't think that really should qualify as treatment, but it is important at least that we name those differences that having something done to you versus someone containing you. I, I do think that they're different, not necessarily okay, either one, but, but different. And with forced containment, in other words, just keeping someone somewhere when someone has deemed them to not be okay to be out in the community on their own for whatever reason, still often involves violations that bear comparison to sexual violence. For example, restraint even without forced drugging or being held down physically is often a part of containment. Mm -hmm. And certainly for me, there are lots of parallels between having someone holding me down, having their hands on my body when I don't want them to be for the purpose of sexual violence and for the purpose of of containment, so to speak. And I think even just being somewhere, being in an environment you do not want to be in that does not feel okay to you and being told you have to stay there and, and even being told you have to stay there for your own good, that often those touch similar places in our spirit, in our emotions that, that really feel quite similar. Absolutely. And I do think regardless, if if someone leaves a forced containment situation or tries to escape, that usually is met with physical violence, tackling or restraint or whatever it is. Is that correct? Absolutely. But it won't get called violence, right? Right. Because the people who are in power define Mm -hmm. what is violence. And so if I hit the person who's restraining me in self-defense, that will certainly show up in my chart as violence. But if they do whatever they're going to do, even to the point of causing bruises or other damage to my body in order to, quote unquote, keep me safe or keep other people in the environment safe, that will not be seen as violence. And so that that is a powerful determinant in in our realities that can be really, really disconcerting and and traumatic. Absolutely. Um, So you've already mentioned some things like strip searches, but can you discuss some of the other instances of sexual violence that occur within psychiatric settings? Sure. So I think one other thing I haven't mentioned yet is that I've, I've been aware of people who've been through forced catheterization during a process of a hospitalization. I believe the justification was you know, that whole process you go through to be admitted to the hospital and all the tests they want to do to see if you are taking any illicit substances or what have you. And that person did not want to cooperate with those tests and and was in a really distressed state. And so they somehow justified that. Mm -hmm. But that absolutely was experienced as sexual violence by that person. Strip searches, as you said, But also just some of the environments, people are often hired into these environments because they are large and very bouncerish, for a lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. And so I know in my hospital experience, for example, I wanted to put on makeup at the time in my life. It was, it may sound silly, but it was a real ritual of mine, sort of a magical perception that I had that if I put on this makeup, it was sort of a mask that would protect me from the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm already distressed and locked in this hospital I don't want to be in, and I want to put on this makeup, and I'm given this choice. I use choice in quotations as well, uh, that I can either not put it on because they're afraid that I somehow might hurt myself with it if I'm left alone with it, or I can go into this really confined space with this large bouncer-looking man and have him hover over me 
while I put it on. And that, even that, it may sound like it doesn't make sense to some people, but if you've been through that kind of abuse, having someone really close to you, watching you, hovering over you in an involuntary way, or when people are sleeping, sometimes it happens when people are in the bathroom. Those things can feel really, really violating. Absolutely. Um, and I think at most settings, they check on you while you're sleeping every 15 minutes or so, right? Oh, yeah. The flashlight in the eyes. Yeah, mm-hmm. some of that can feel violating just of your own space. But I know for me as a survivor of sexual violence, I have an incredible difficulty sleeping around people mm-hmm. for just that sort of reason. I, I It's a lack of awareness of who's in my space and the idea that people are just going to routinely come in is really, really hard. I mean, frankly, it's, it's hard to be told, oh, you're in the most distressed moment or one of the most distressed moments of your life. Here's what we have for you. We have a stranger in the bed next to you. That's hard enough without yeah. people who have power over you coming into that space while you're so vulnerable. And of course, there are also lots of instances if you look online or if you talk to people who've been in these environments, there's lots of instances where the environment is so chaotic or so poorly managed and people in staff roles really are intentionally using power to gain sexual favors over people or sometimes it's going on between other people hospitalized. Yeah, this happens in a number of ways. Absolutely, yeah. So can you speak to the role that victim blaming often plays in the ways we respond to both psychiatric survivors and sexual violence survivors? Sure. So as I mentioned, I'm a survivor of rape and childhood sexual abuse and, and also the psychiatric system. And I've, I've heard all sorts of reasons justifying some of the experiences I've had with men. Some of that's been about how drunk I got. So when I was 16, I think one of my first experiences drinking was with two male friends and they did, they, they ended up holding me down and touching me in ways that I wasn't okay with until a, another friend intervened. And I was blamed for that when I talked with people about it. I was blamed for it because I was drinking in this environment where there weren't other people around. And also because then I didn't do something with it fast enough. So I think that's really common. Uh, I had another experience on a college campus with, with an older man who was hanging around and he followed me into my dorm and forced me to, to kiss him and wanted to do more, but I got away from him. But he did follow me back outside and what he said to me is stuck with me forever. It was about how I was really at fault because of the makeup I was wearing mm. and that In his culture, the only way that he could see a woman like me non-sexually would be if I agreed to be a sister, but that if I agreed to be a sister, I also needed to agree to do whatever he told me. And, you know, I never explored what that meant, but uh, these are just a couple of examples of of ways that I was held responsible for the Mm -hmm. way that men treated me. And then, you know, in the psychiatric system, very similar sorts of things happen. Uh, I'm treated as at fault for any emotional distress I have. People don't ask questions or aren't interested in some of the trauma I've experienced. If they do hear the trauma at all, they see it as separate from or in addition to or perhaps making worse what was already wrong with me. And actually, For me, and I've said this a number of times when I'm out speaking, for me to share my story, to say that I do not accept the psychiatric diagnoses I've been given, to say that I don't want to be called mentally ill, that I want to have my trauma heard and I want to have people recognize that that's impacted how I am in this world, and to have them come up and say how powerful my story is and then continue on with all the mental illness language as soon as it's all done Mm -hmm. is, is so erasing. It's, it's not only erasing of me, but it also gives people a pass who hurt me. It's, it's a way of saying, well, we thought your story was powerful. We hear that you've experienced all this violence in your life. But 
really the problem's still in your head. If not right. for those problems in your head, you would have been okay, even right. even though all those things have happened. And so that all has has really had an impact on me. I've really had to push back on this idea that somehow it's still ultimately all rests inside me, that that's where the problem started and ended. Um, I was thinking about that, especially with trauma-informed care. I hear people you know, claiming to be pro-trauma-informed care, but sometimes I think it ends up meaning kind of somewhat acknowledging the role of trauma, but really still saying, oh, but there's something wrong with this person and they need to be treated. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about the trauma, but not much. Do you find that to be true? I think trauma-informed care is a bit of a mess. I think that it's misunderstood in so many different ways. I mean, first of all, Sometimes people use it as a justification for trauma-specific care, and the difference being, you know, of course, with trauma-informed care, it just means creating environments and being ways of being with one another where we assume that we've had lots of really traumatic experiences and don't want to make it worse. Trauma-specific care, on the other hand, means let me ask you 5,000 really personal questions about the trauma you've experienced so we can try and work on that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not helpful. But then beyond that, sure, lots of mental health environments are referring to themselves now as trauma informed without any real sense of what that means. And still seeing them as separate. I see it all the time in presentations about how trauma doesn't really cause these issues, but it might maybe for someone who's already predisposed to these issues, maybe it tripped the wire or maybe it made it worse, but people don't seem to understand that, no, these experiences really shape people and there's much more science supporting that than there ever has been for this medical model of mental illness. Um, and you've spoken a bit about language throughout the interview. So could you tell us a bit about how the language of the psychiatric system can be used to pathologize or re-traumatize survivors of sexual violence? Sure. Well, I think just starting with mental illness, for me, as I, as I already said, for me, every time someone says I'm mentally ill, then what they mean most of the time is that there's something wrong in my head, that something wrong with my brain. I have a diseased brain that has caused these things to happen. And so it's a way of, for me, denying trauma. And I think a lot of people who have experienced trauma, especially sexual violence, have experienced people denying it happens. So all of those things come together to compound one another. But also language like non-compliance. People use it so easily in the mental health system. And I've started to describe it as violent language because non-compliance basically means we will want you to do something and you're not doing it and therefore you're bad. And if you boil it down to that, then that's also something that people quite frequently hear from people who have raped them or sexually abused them. I want you to do something. If you don't do it, then you're bad. And I don't want to be a part of a system that tells people that they are bad somehow simply for not doing what someone else has told them to do. Definitely. And um, I think that touches on gaslighting, too. And can you speak a bit more about gaslighting and the way that that plays a role in how we respond to both psychiatric survivors and survivors of sexual violence? Sure. Well, I think along the same lines, people who get these psychiatric diagnoses, someone else is defining their reality for them. And if I say my reality is different than that, in fact, I just recently had an argument on Facebook on this organization's page where they were talking quite disparagingly about people with psychiatric diagnoses. And I explained that I was someone who had been given those diagnoses and did not believe they applied to me. And they just immediately went down that old line of how, well, look at that, you're denying that you are mentally ill and that's just proof that you are mentally ill. I don't know if there's anything more gaslighting or more maddening than having someone that's backed by the power of an entire system tell you that the moment you deny what they say that 
it's just proof that you're crazy and shouldn't be listened to. Mm-hmm. And that sort of thing happens all the time. It happens when people talk about hearing voices. It's happened when I've self-injured. People have put their definitions on me. And if I disagree with it, then it's almost as if it just gets used as proof that I'm somehow dangerous. I need to be contained. And and in fact, there's a risk if you challenge other people's reality for you of, of experiencing more violence as a result of being forced into the hospital simply on that basis. And they have that, they, they cooked up this whole new diagnosis. I, I guess it's not so new, but anosognosia. I don't know if you've heard that word. Yeah. That's a favorite of places like the Treatment Advocacy Center where they've actually taken this diagnosis out of the, the truly medical world for people who've had strokes or what have you and actually have some brain damage that prevents them from recognizing certain things about their body. And they've applied it to people with psychiatric diagnoses essentially to say, well, you don't really have insight into your own reality. And so we're going to diagnose you in that way now to further discredit you and further take away your voice and believability. Yeah, absolutely. And do you find there are specific diagnoses where that's used more than others, or do you think it's kind of applied to all diagnoses? Well, I think that it can be applied to all diagnoses, but certainly diagnoses like schizophrenia are seen as the most severe uh, often and and where people's realities are questioned the most. But I also think diagnoses like borderline personality disorder, where it's actually quite common that diagnosis for people who've experienced sexual trauma Mm -hmm. and their perceptions of relationships, their experiences of what's happened to them, their choices about how to talk about their trauma and, and the meaning of things is, is often questioned. Sort of the basis of that diagnosis is that someone doesn't really have a true sense of themselves and that they're just always trying to manipulate other people somehow. It's a really painful diagnosis. It is a diagnosis that has been given to me, and it was, in fact, the diagnosis that was given to me that helped me realize that I wanted nothing to do with the mental health system. Um, yeah, I've, I've spoken with a lot of people, and including myself, who have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and um, I've heard very similar stories from a lot of people that speaking out about any kind of abuse um, that could have caused their distress or symptoms is then seen as further proof of the fact that they have borderline personality disorder, that they're not willing to take responsibility and instead are blaming these other people. And, oh, that's classic borderline. Um, Have you found that to be true as well? Yeah, well, I think that people don't want to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. People don't want to be uncomfortable. And often when trauma survivors are speaking about sexual trauma and other devastating things that happen in their life, they also aren't calm when they speak about them. Yeah. And that makes sense because these have been really, really difficult experiences. And so you have two things that people are uncomfortable with. They're uncomfortable with big emotions and people expressing them and not being able to stop them or control that. And you have people talking about things like rape and incest and so on. And that also makes people really uncomfortable, especially since it's tied in with misogyny and so much other systemic oppression that happens in our culture. And I think that for people who don't want to be so uncomfortable, it's easy to say, oh, this person's just out of control. This person's just crazy. Listen to how they're speaking, listen to what they're saying. And let's, let's put that in a diagnosis so that we can feel that we're actually doing the right thing when we ignore them. Because that's kind of what that diagnosis says. And of course, dialectical behavior therapy, which I know some people feel has really benefited them, is shaped around this idea that people shouldn't go too far into their own trauma until they've done enough work that they aren't so quote-unquote fragile and it really isn't something that should be talked about because it's going to be too triggering for people it's not a word I'm a fan of but that's that's what gets said and all of these things are also ways that people in provider roles and people in the general community can protect themselves from having to hear about the terrible things that happen. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And I was going to ask more about that. In some of our previous discussions, you've spoken about the ways in which survivors of sexual violence are discouraged from speaking about their experiences in psychiatric settings, including through trigger warnings. Um, could you say more about that and the various ways that people are silenced? Sure. I'm not a huge fan of trigger warnings. I mean, I, you know, up, up to a point, someone pointed out to me recently, well, of course, when movies get rated, it gives you a little bit of information about what to expect, or even just reading a description of a workshop or a movie gives you some idea of what to expect. But these trigger warnings, this treating of our culture is so fragile is not something that I think has done us a lot of good. And I think overall that in environments where people are giving lots of trigger warnings all the time, I see people take on that role. It's almost like the Stanford prison experiment. I mean, just a little microcosm of, of that sort of response of where someone's given a role and you're told that, oh, you might be triggered, you're fragile, we want to be very careful about this, then people kind of move themselves into that role. And I don't know that it's all that healthy. But I think the other message that that sort of approach sends is that we, those of us who have survived this sort of violence, whether it's violence in the mental health system or sexual violence or some combination thereof, that we're somehow too much for everyone else, that we're actually the cause of people being upset, that if we share what's really happened to us, then actually that might make other bad things happen. And those messages, if you just, again, boil them down to the most basic message that's coming across, those are the same kinds of messages that a lot of us have been given by the people who have hurt us, the people who have perpetrated sexual violence against us, especially, I don't know how many times I've heard people who have experienced sexual violence say, well, I didn't tell because I was under the impression or I was told that if I, I said something, it would make some other bad thing happen. And, and this is now the message of this quote-unquote trauma-informed culture that we're building up around us, and, and I don't think that's healthy. I also just recently was a part of putting out a survey for our alternative suicide groups. We're attempting to collect some outcome information from people who have attended them. And there's a quote that I just pulled that I thought was applicable from one of the survey responses that we got so far from someone who's attended alternative suicide groups. And this person said, I really appreciate that I can talk about things by name without having to be euphemistic and assuming that the other people in the group were too fragile to hear what I was going to say. This is the only group where I can actually say the word rape and not have anyone tell me that's too triggering and that I can't say that. I'm also not expected to just get over it and that if I'm upset about being raped, it's not because I'm doing a bad job coping or haven't worked hard enough in, in treatment. Wow. I thought that was a powerful quote. That's very powerful. Um, kind of along that line, I've been thinking a lot about the topic of oversharing, and I know that's sometimes seen as a symptom of borderline personality disorder and um, just the idea of sharing um, about topics within certain categories, um, usually a lot of times sexual assault. I know me personally, I was told that sharing about my sexual assault with my graduate school classmates was a form of oversharing um, in dialectical behavior therapy. Um, do you have any thoughts on that topic and on kind of the ways that that's used to silence stories of sexual violence? Sure. Well, I think the first question to ask is who's defining what oversharing is. I mean, I, I know that I have been in situations where the conversation has felt non-consensual, where <laughs> I have five minutes and someone without any warning arrives and wants to give me 60 minutes of their experience without pausing right. to see if I have that time or that availability. And that can be really frustrating for sure. But in most situations where I see people get accused of oversharing, it's not based on that. It's based on this much more rigid idea that there's certain things we just don't talk about. And I think that, that idea that there's just these things we shouldn't talk about that are too big to be heard by most people that is so damaging. So usually when I hear someone define something as oversharing, it's either 
someone who's been clinically trained to to look out for keeping topics contained on the basis that everyone's too fragile to really hear them or someone who's really absorbed those sorts of ideas. And I, and I don't think it does us any good. I mean, as a mother of two kids, I have a 15 year old and I have a six year old and both of them in grade school were taught that naming penis or vagina was a bathroom word. And I know this is a little bit off track, but it, I think applies. I was horrified that my kids at these young ages in kindergarten, I think, were being taught that saying the parts of their body was in essence oversharing or dirty or bad or only to be said in the bathroom somehow. And that's how we start kids off. And so I think usually when we get to the point of adulthood, we've really ingrained all these topics that are taboo and shouldn't get talked about. But I think that harms us. Any topic that has fell into that category, I think, harms us, whether it's thoughts of suicide or it's the things that have happened to us that we're trying to contain. We shouldn't have to walk around this world feeling like we are too much or, or the things we have to say are too much. Because if, if my talking about having been raped is too much for anyone else to even hear, then what does that say about my ability to survive what actually happened. I feel like most other people are able to to hear that. They're able to sit with one another and we'd be a much healthier society if we stopped trying to fix and silence and stop big emotions and could just sit with each other and, and hear those things and say thank you for sharing that I feel honored that you trusted me to share that rather than trying to silence it. Absolutely. Um, So lastly, how do you think instances of sexual violence that occur within psychiatric settings can be better addressed in both public and media discussions of sexual violence in general? Well, the media is a tricky topic because at least the, the mainstream media is really hard to access. The people who control mainstream media, I don't always quite know exactly who, but it's generally people with money and a lot of power and a lot of connections and a lot of privilege. And that's often not us, but I think some of the things that are really important are just at the foundational level. Somehow I think we need to work on a clear understanding in the mainstream somehow of the fact that psychiatric settings involve a lot of violence period. And that that's getting called treatment, but actually is so harmful. And and that science and that information is there. We have science and research now saying, telling us very clearly that hospitalizing people, particularly against their will, has long-term negative effects and that the positive effects are are pretty questionable. And I don't know how, how we keep ignoring that, but I feel... Like somehow we have to figure out how to get at this idea of of violence and psychiatric oppression and what that really is. And I think we also need to build that understanding of, of what it's like when someone loses control and loses their sense of value. And I don't know if there's a different way we could come at it that would help people relate their own experiences. I think that what I've learned over time is that people just generally aren't going to take it in if they can't relate what I'm saying, the pain I've experienced to their own experiences in some way. And I guess what I mean by that is, uh, for example, I've started to do this exercise with providers where I'll give them kind of this 12 blocks of different things. And they say things like, I get to choose who I live with and sleep next to and I, if I go to the doctor, I don't immediately have to have someone else know the results unless I want them to. And I can be pretty sure that there aren't meetings happening about me without me present. Just 12 different items, and sometimes I, I change them up. And then what I'll ask providers to do is, after we've read them all aloud, I'll say, now cross off whichever one you're willing to give up first. And then whichever one you're willing to give up second and then third, and we'll go through the whole 12. And I will explain to them why we're doing that. And they usually 
someone's getting angry by the middle of it or just stops participating because they can't figure out which one they would give up next. But the point of that exercise is that at the end, I get to say, however hard that was for you, whatever emotions came up for you when you were doing that just as an exercise, those are things that people give up all at the same time the moment they enter a hospital or a residential program. And so I think we need to look for those sorts of exercises, those sorts of ways at getting at things and helping people look at them as if they're happening to them in some sort of way. But I guess also we're in a culture now where we can take advantage of the reality that a lot of not mainstream media can be reaching people. I think of Daniel Mackler all the time who just got sick of being a therapist and stopped that and picked up a video camera and went around the world and made these four different films that all relate back to psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. And hundreds of thousands of people have seen those at this point. And it's not because they're so slick or look like they were made in Hollywood. It's because there's good information and he was able to distribute them at low cost and now put them on YouTube for free. And I wish that more people realize that they don't need to make things that are perfect, that we can just be using those modes much, much more and better than we do. Um, And what about getting these kinds of issues brought up specifically in discussions of sexual violence? Um, Do you think there's ways to do that? So are you asking the relating psychiatric and sexual violence? Yeah. Well, I think that it would be great if there were more of us just willing to start those conversations. I think that we are getting a fair number of platforms, Not, not necessarily mainstream media, but we are getting more platforms these days at conferences and in writing and and in making our own materials and videos. And I think that we just, we need to start being willing to name those things. And, and hopefully I think, I know I'm, I'm willing to make people uncomfortable. I don't know about you at this point, but uh, hopefully more and more of us can just go out and start naming these things so that people can get used to hearing about it. I know that when I was just in Australia, for example, uh, Caroline, my coworker and I were just in Australia doing a lot of training on on alternatives to suicide. And I routinely, when I shared my story there, talked about the fact that I had been raped. And in fact, I opened my story very often with that, without any warning, without any trigger warnings. And shared that and shared how that related to what led up to my experiences in the system and how I was diagnosed. And there was one instance where someone said, oh, they really should have had trigger warnings on that. But we didn't, you know, and we continued not to. And we continued to just feel like it's okay if people have big feelings in response to these things. Maybe those big feelings need to be felt. And instead of saying, oh, yes, I should have had a warning on my story, my experience, turning to those who have big emotions and want to make accusations about us should have, you know, putting a trigger warning on something, just saying, well, why do you think it felt so big to you? Is that something you want to talk about? So I think that we can do a much better job of, of going into those conversations, stepping into those conversations and not just silencing them the moment that someone gets upset yeah definitely cool well thank you so much i just really wanted to thank you for coming on the show i've always admired how much your work really tackles taboo topics and um kind of shares what makes everyone else uncomfortable and what everyone else or most (laughs) other people are too too uncomfortable to share so um thank you so much for that and for sharing more of that on this podcast thanks emily Well, I just want to thank Sarah and Emily for that discussion and to say that if you'd like to know more about Sarah's work, you can find links on the post that accompanies this interview on MadelAmerica.com. So thanks for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit MadenAmerica.com for more news, views and updates. 